Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim podcast. Very, very excited about today's show. Have an awesome individual who's out there trying to collect the best health information on the web, the truest health information on the web, and simplifying it and bringing it together, cultivating it, because there's just so much stuff out there. And he's doing that in the form of two awesome online magazines. The first is paleoliving.com. The second is healthyrecipes.com. And he is none other than Jeremy Hendon. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thanks so much, Jonathan. It's, It's very exciting to be here. And thank you for having me on. Well, Jeremy, thank you, and I, I very much appreciate you know the opportunity to contribute to both of your magazines, and you're doing all kinds of stuff, brother. Tell, tell us how you got started really connecting all the dots and, and curating all of the vast amount of health content that exists on the web. <laughs> it's, a, it's, you know, it's a long and varied story, and I have to say that like most people, it's, it's probably less interesting than it sounds at first because... When you say connecting all the dots, I was I was drawing all around the dots for most of my life and had no <laughs> idea where most of the dots were. So it's uh it's one of those stories where, you know, I was I was an overweight, chubby kid, never particularly obese or, you know, never had any really serious health problems, but definitely wasn't healthy for most of my life. And uh kind of changed when I went to college. I had a change of setting and uh, and actually, that's one of the things that I'm most interested in is uh, changing our environment and our habits. But it's, uh, you know, I changed certain things then. It wasn't the healthiest way to do it, but I found a way to to lose weight and get healthier in college and really just started delving into the science and spent about 10 to 15 years really, you know, reading a lot of medical journals, nutrition journals, not understanding them for five or six years, uh, and, and finally uh, coming around to where I am now, which... I feel like I've got a much better perspective, but there's still a whole lot to learn out there, and I don't think it'll ever end. Well, Jeremy, it sounds like we certainly have a kindred spirit vibe going on, and fascinating that we've arrived at a similar spot, which is, uh, generally speaking, I mean, you have two publications. One is the Healthy Recipes magazine, which is a bit more, let's call it mainstream, if that's a fair characterization. And the other one is the Paleo Living magazine, which is, of course, focused a bit more on eating things that were available to our ancestors, eating things found directly in nature. But it seems like you did not necessarily start your journey saying, I want to eat like a caveman, which is sometimes how paleo is described. You rather just said, I'm going to look at the actual scientific research. And it just so happens that a a paleo lifestyle, or as it should just be called, eating the foods you find in nature, ironically, is the quote unquote diet that is most supported by the scientific literature. Yeah, absolutely. And and maybe not so ironically. I mean, maybe (laughs) (laughs) thought about this, you know, a long time ago that, you know, all the things that we're cooking up in chemical labs now might not be the healthiest things that we can eat and might not really be uh, great for our bodies. I, you know, I, I've read a lot of your work, and like, like you said, you've contributed some stuff to our magazines. And like you say, a lot of the foods that are out there natural lead to your sane approach. That is, you know, they're a lot more satiating because they have a lot more fat or a lot more fiber, things that actually make us full. So you're absolutely right. I didn't come to this with any preconceived notions of where I was going to end up. I certainly didn't start, you know, 15 years ago thinking, oh my God, I really need to eat like a caveman. You know, that just sounds so brilliant. Um, and even now, you know, I, I don't buy into 100% of the, the paleo uh, way of life, although I, I buy into most of it and think that for most people, it's a, a fantastic starting place. And, uh, you know, once you do it for a while, you can really see how your body reacts and really start to customize it and, and think about the other scientific ways that you can really uh, enhance your body and enhance your diet. Well, I love it, Jeremy, and I think it, it gets back, I sometimes use the analogy, and I'm very curious to get your thoughts on this because you, you've you surveyed many different sources, so I'm interested in your perspective here, and that's this this uh, this concept of uh, the Tower of Babel. Are you familiar with that story in, in the Bible? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so it's just really just for, for folks who may not be familiar with it, it's the, this idea that there were people who wanted to build a tower that reached all the way up to heaven and, and, and sort of make themselves into gods and show that they could do 
they could become gods. And in fact, when they tried to do this, the tower became so high it crumbled over. And the moral of the story is don't try to outsmart nature. Don't try to outsmart God. Whatever your beliefs are, understand that we aren't gods. (laughs) Right, right, right. The reason I mention that is just there's this paradox of – since we have made so many scientific, like since the technological progress we've made over the past 50 years, right, it's been exponential. We were seeing a greater rate of change and a greater rate of advancement and knowledge than we've ever seen before. Simultaneously, we've gotten less healthy. And you would think that as we become more advanced, we would actually become healthier because we would find advancements that, that again, make us healthier. But in fact, the exact opposite has happened. And the more we've tried to engineer our health, it's a bit like building a, a metabolic tower of Babel. We've tried to re-engineer nature, and it has backfired horribly. What are your thoughts on that? I completely agree. And I mean, I think it's a two-sided coin. I mean, we could have whole political discussions on this, too, You know, talking about whether or not we think that getting more technologically advanced should also lead us to be more peaceful. But you know, it's really a two-sided coin because a lot of people look at what I do on the one hand with the paleo way of life and say, oh you know, you're against all technology, I say, well, no, of course not. You know, modern antibiotics, modern medicine, you know, like if I break my arm, I'm going to go to the doctor. I love the fact that they have modern technology to fix these kind of things because it's brilliant and it saves lives and there's no reason to forego most of that technology. At the same time, what you just said is 100% true. We are not often conscious enough or cautious enough about how we use a lot of that technology, particularly when it comes to things like engineering food. And and people have to realize that a lot of the companies out there who are engineering food, they're not evil in any way. They're not bad people. They're people like you and I who just have a different job. And But the point of their job and of their company is to make money and create products that sell better and essentially that get people addicted to them. So there needs to be more conscientiousness. There needs to be more cautiousness when it comes to this technology And, you know, what you and I both do is we kind of try to get this information out there. We say, hey, look, there's all this technology out there, all this science, and it's getting misused in some ways. And it's not going to be healthy for you. And it's not going to treat your body in the way that nature intended for your body to thrive. And so we need to kind of think about that and take a step back and say, which technology do we want to keep? You know, if you get sick, then you probably do need to take a little bit of medicine or go to the doctor in some ways. And, you know, apart from that, we need to look at more natural ways to keep our bodies optimized and healthy. Jeremy, it, it, I, I love this because I think we can go and, and listeners, please forgive, but I think we're going to have to wax philosophical here for a second. I, can't, <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot avoid it because one, one thing that I think is, is a fascinating distinction here, like you made the point of all the technological progress we've made and all the medical progress we've made on, I've heard doctors refer to it as like ER treatment or like crisis management, where if you're in a car accident, there was never a better time to, to have a compound fracture in your leg than right now. Because if, if a system just breaks, an acute breakdown in the system, we can go in and we can do pretty amazing things to help bring that system back to life. But this idea, so that is very different from saying, Uh, you can uh, break a system down, keep doing what it took to chronically break that system down, and we will give you something that will enable you to keep doing the behavior that caused the breakdown in the first place, but but in some ways mask the symptoms, right? Like giving a diabetic insulin is not the same as putting a leg in a cast because when we put a leg in a cast, it's assumed you will stop doing the thing that caused the leg to break in the first place. We're not giving you the cast so you can go break your leg again or empower you to continue to break your leg. Whereas when we do things like, for example, diabetes treatment, some Diabetes is a, a potentially fatal disease, type 2 diabetes, but it's, oh, very. it's yeah. trivialized because it's like, well, you can just take insulin. Well, wait a second. Let's, what's the problem with that? Like you said, I mean, the problem is that it doesn't actually address the cause of that problem. Like you said, if you break your leg in a car accident or falling off a roof, you assume that you're going to put it in a cast and you're not going to fall off another roof the next day, <laughs> which is you know, a pretty good assumption because most people who break their leg are not going to climb back up on the roof the next day. And, and try to you know, do whatever they were doing again. Maybe they will in a year, you know, year from now and break it again. But essentially, you're not doing it every day. Uh, you know, with something like diabetes, um, 
for which there are a myriad of causes. I mean, there's no single cause. But at the same time, like you said, treating it with insulin is not addressing any of those causes, right? The cause is not a lack of insulin. That's actually an effect of diabetes and effect of uh, not having enough insulin sensitivity. And like you said, the science of treating that now has come down to the point that we're just going to treat the symptoms and it's not going to treat any of those causes. And I, like you said, we both wax poetic about this, but it's the huge difference between looking at the science and saying, yes, we can treat this acute injury, treat this acute injury and fix it. Or we can have this systemic problem where people are eating terribly unhealthy foods, getting unhealthier day by day by day. We're going to let them keep doing that, but we're going to try to find ways to minimize the symptoms and problems that arise out of that, which is essentially what giving insulin to a type 2 diabetic does. And, you know, there, there are a lot more things we could talk about than just diabetes. I mean, in terms of obesity, heart disease, but all of those problems today, like you said, are treated with the end in mind that we're just going to minimize the symptoms rather than actually cure any of the causes. And that's where the distinction comes in between using science to its fullest, which I feel like you and I really want to do. I mean, we're both really into the science. I love reading the science. I've always been really into the science, but at some point we've got to take a step back and say, okay, the science is doing a ton for us and we're learning a ton from the science, but let's also take a step back and just look at how we can change our daily lives. You know, how can we change our diet on a daily basis? How can I do little things every day that are going to keep me from needing to take insulin, that are going to keep me from needing to take statins, which I, you know, I don't even think are great to begin with, but are going to keep me from needing to do things down the line to minimize or have any of those problems in the first place. Yeah, it, it, you hit the nail on the head there, Jeremy. It's the difference. It's kind of a silly analogy, but it, it's the difference between someone who is touching a hot stove and burning their hand and is upset about that and saying, well, that's okay. Let me just shoot some Novocaine into your hand and you'll be all right. You just keep on <laughs> touching the stove and it doesn't hurt anymore. So we're good, right? No, like your hand is eventually going to become like, I don't want to get gross, but it's going to get gangrene. And it's just, you can't keep doing that. And I think sometimes when, if if we have a situation, we got to look at it and say, am I using science and technology to mask a, a, something that is incompatible at, at, at a, at a molecular or a cellular level. And when we get into that, like that's what a statin or that is what insulin for a type two, obviously type one diabetic is born a different thing. Type two diabetic develops over time due in many ways to lifestyle behaviors is if we're using science and technology to cover something up and, and to mask something that is not furthering our goals of being healthy. Correct. Absolutely. And I, I think your analogy is perfect with somebody you know, putting their hand on a stove. I mean, even if it were just, you know, like a, a stove that's not too hot, but one that's going to eventually burn you if you leave it on there. I mean, it's one of those things where you're not going to leave it on there. I mean, you know intuitively that it's going to burn you in the end. And even if you're constantly getting shot up with Novocaine or you're taking some other kind of painkiller, it's not going to be good for your hands. So I, I completely agree. Well, and, and Jeremy, as we talk about getting getting healthy or using that term specifically, you have a, a really popular art, article on one of your sites called "Quit Trying to Quote Unquote Get Healthy," and and I want to just dig into that <laughs> a little bit because we always hear about like just do this one thing, try this one pill, take this right approach, and you will get healthy. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think overall, what I am have become most focused on in the past couple of years is the mentality behind trying to get healthy because, I, like I said, I love the science and I, I love to talk about it, I love to read about it, and I love to you know write about nutrition and things, but I feel like the biggest missing piece for most people is really approaching the whole issue in the right way. And now I don't think there is a single right way, but I do think there are some ways that don't work in general. And one of those ways is trying to, what I call, get healthy. And that's the idea that someday you're going to be healthy, that <laughs> someday you're going to reach this promised land, that someday you're going to build the Tower of Babel and finally get there, right? And I think that is a flawed conception. Healthy is not a state that we reach. Yeah, we can look at certain biomarkers and say, you know, you're doing well or somebody is quote unquote healthier than another person, but healthy is a way of being. It's a way of viewing your life. It's a way of interacting day to day with yourself, with your diet 
and with everything that you do. And I think that kind of approach, if people start to understand that it's something that you have to do rather than achieve, then it's much easier to get there. And it's also much, much more enjoyable because once you start to view it that way, every little thing that you do during your day that is slightly, quote unquote, healthier is much more uh, appealing and much more satis uh, and much more rewarding. And I think that's really, really important to have those little rewards every day, because if you're just trying to get there in the end, you're going to have some falls along the way, right? You're going to cheat some days. You're not going to go to the gym some days or work out, whatever it is you're trying to do. And you're going to feel like you're further away from your goal than you were before. And it's going to disappoint you. Whereas on the other hand, if you can just do little things every day to try to get a little bit healthier at a time and just constantly be healthier, then that's much, much more, more rewarding on a daily basis. And I think that's mentally more sustainable and something that can really help people live a better and happier life, to be frank. I love the distinction, Jeremy, between getting healthy and and being or acting healthy reminds me of one of my favorite authors of all time is is Dr. Stephen Covey, uh, the late Dr. Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits and all that fun stuff. And he talks about how people have this concept of falling in love or or getting uh, to be in a state of love with another person. And he's like, well, you don't do that. You just need to act lovingly, like act lovingly. And eventually love will manifest itself. It's not an end point. Loving is a way of being and treating other people. And if you just are that way, love will ensue rather than being the direct pursuit of your life. Do you think there's a, a similar parallel here with health? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I love Stephen Covey. I love that particular book. I love a lot of his other stuff. And I completely agree that, you know, whether we're talking about love, health, really any state of being in our lives, we've come to the point. It reminds me of something you said early when we were chatting about 10 minutes ago, where you said, you know, at some point we started looking for a pill or a cure or something that would cure a lot of the problems. For instance, you know, diabetes or heart disease, we now take pills or insulin or something instead of trying to look at a daily basis and see what we can do bit by bit to make ourselves a little bit better. So I think there's exactly a parallel between what you said earlier, between you know Stephen Covey's thoughts on love and between everything that we do to try to be healthy. Because I think realistically, as humans, we are not set up, and, and this is part of an evolutionary protocol or an evolutionary look at humans and the human brain, human brains are not set up to try to achieve goals five years down the road. No animals are. We can do it. We can plan. But we're not set up on a daily basis to think about what's going to happen and to take that into account and be rewarded or scared by it five years down the road. Because humans, like any other animal, are, are evolutionary adapted to survive from day to day. So you might be able to think a week, a month ahead of time because you're worried about not having enough food a week or a month ahead of time. But in general, we need to focus on a daily basis on the little things that we do. We need to get rewards out of those, kind of reward our brain for saying, yeah, this is this is something that's great. This is something that's making me better, something that's making my life more enjoyable. And, and I think that last bit, too, about enjoyability, and this relates back to the love also, is that when you find yourself being able to express more love, express more healthiness on a daily basis, it really leads to a lot more sense of a lot greater sense of satisfaction on a daily basis. At least that's how I found it. And a lot of people that I've I kind of helped in this respect and talked to ha have found that to be the case. I think you you're spot on, Jeremy. And I, I, I don't want to belabor the analogy, but I think it actually fits quite well, because let's talk. Let's make the analogy again to human relationships. And certainly there are like if we're experiencing a sense of loneliness, there are things that we can do uh like find a random person at a bar and engage in certain behaviors with them that might for a short period of time make us feel better. But long term, that is certainly not going to do anything about that sense of loneliness. And in fact, it might compound it. I feel like sometimes we have a similar challenge with health where because we feel unhealthy or because we have a lack of energy, we then look to junk edible products like we might be looking to a junk temporary relationship in, in the in the in the short analogy or in the analogy from earlier to create that temporary fix, but in reality it really is to mix all kinds of metaphors, just shoot Novocaine into the hand, which we're just going to burn worse and worse and worse until we fix that underlying mental state. 
What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I would even go a step further to say that this all sounds a little bit foo-foo-y, I think, when I talk about it sometimes. But but there's hard science behind it, too, whether we're talking about one night stands at a bar, or whether we're talking about eating junk food when you're upset or not feeling healthy or, you know, in some other emotional state. These things actually affect your brain chemically and affect your entire body chemically. They have, you know, chemical releases, endorphins, dopamine responses, and they actually affect the way that you feel on a chemical and physical level. And so it really is something, like you said, that our bodies and our minds view as a quick fix, but in the end, it's not a fix at all. You know, it is like shooting Novocaine into your hand while leaving it on the stove. You're not fixing the loneliness by going into a bar and having a one night stand. You're not fixing your health problems by eating a little bit of junk food or even eating, uh, you know, a quote unquote health product or a supplement, which, you know, people are still really into supplements. And I find that, uh, you know, a lot of my readers will ask me questions like, oh, you know, is the supplement great? Will this supplement, you know, help me with my health or help me with this problem? And my response is always, well, it's kind of the wrong question to ask. It might actually, some of the supplements might actually have some positive effects. You know, they might actually do something small, but it's kind of the wrong mentality to take because you're not really addressing the, the core root of the problem like you're talking about. You're not taking your hand off the stove. You're not fixing your loneliness by acting in a loving or relationship way every day. And with health, it's, health is the same. You've got to talk to yourself in a different way. You've got to actually learn to enjoy being active, eating whole real foods. And I think that's what it all comes down to is approaching it differently. And I think it's no coincidence that we actually refer in many ways to eating in our lifestyle. We talk about our relationship with food. We, we, that's a common term. What is your relationship with food? And just think about that back to the, your point about supplements, which is beautiful, is if, if, if we're in a, a, God forbid, in a dysfunctional marriage or a dysfunctional partnership, there's all kinds of like, just try to use I statements when talking and just try to like these, these more, again, back to Stephen Covey, more of these practice centered approaches. Whereas what we really might need is to go a level deeper in that more of a principle centered approach. And that's one of the things that's neat about paleo, where it takes more of a principle centered approach, which is this template of we evolved over many, many millions of years, and we evolved in a certain environment. And the further we've gotten away from that environment, the sicker we've gotten. That doesn't mean we need to all go live in caves. It just means that let's be sensitive to those changes and let's look a level deeper. And, and again, we didn't, it's not as if we had always been sick and then, uh, the supplement CoQ10 pills came out and no, <laughs> and, and a bunch of people were no longer sick. So therefore the cause of our illness is a CoQ10 supplement deficiency. No, it's not right. Like we were all healthier before a CoQ10 supplement even existed. Does that mean it's bad? No. But does that mean it's more important than just eating a lot of vegetables and fresh meats and seafoods and whole food fats? Absolutely not, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we focus on all, not the wrong things. We focus on the small things. And I, you know, I don't want to discourage people from focusing on some of those things because especially for some particular issues, they can be really great. If you really have a vitamin D deficiency, you should be supplementing with vitamin D, you know, if you've actually gotten it tested. But at the same time, long term, you should be getting out in the sun more. You should be eating more, you know, seafood that's high in vitamin D, things that are more long term daily solutions to these problems. And I, I, you know, I just couldn't agree more with the analogies that you use there and, and the whole logic behind it. When focusing on the the big stuff, tell me what you think about the following, because because I think we're, we're really on to something here. And that's until you're getting the, the bulk of the food you eat from a volume perspective should be nutrient dense plants. So we're talking low fructose fruits, we're talking non-starchy vegetables, and then uh, probably the bulk of your calories, because right, those fruits and vegetables are very, they're not calorically dense, they just take up a lot of space. The bulk of your calories is then to be coming from nutrient dense sources of protein, such as like a grass fed meat, wild caught fish, and whole food fats like nuts and seeds, avocados, cocoa, coconut. That's really the three big pieces, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
I would also throw in there being, you know, moving around some. Oh, and, certainly. Yes, yes, and, that's true. And getting, <laughs> but from, and getting sleep. I think sleep's the most important one. But yeah. yeah and I also mean, water. Absolutely. Water would probably need yeah. to be in there, too. <laughs> and, and air. I mean, you know, and air, yes, and air. A <laughs> small one. <laughs> can't, can't shut yourself off from that. But no, absolutely. From, from a dietary nutrition perspective, I don't think, you know, unless you've got, like we were talking about at the beginning of this podcast, unless you've got an acute problem, you know, something that's causing you severe problems that you've had diagnosed, say you're really deficient in a vitamin or something that's causing severe problems, unless you're in one of those boats, which most people are not, you're right. Every, what it all comes down to is eating nutrient-dense food that's non-toxic. Um, and I think that's as simple as I can put it. And that's usually how I tell it to people because a lot of people know me as somebody who practices a paleo way of life. And there's a lot of confusion around what paleo means. And I try to simplify it as much as you try to simplify the science and say, look, all we're trying to do is eat foods that are higher in nutrients, lower in toxins. That's mm. all we're trying to do. And really just eating in a way that furthers our goals. And if, if, if our goal, I mean, to be very clear, if your goal is let me back up. There are people who can smoke and not get lung cancer. That doesn't mean we should recommend smoking. And it also doesn't mean that smoking isn't a causal agent in the development of lung cancer. That said, is there a place in your life to eat edible junk food? Well, I would say the question to ask yourself is, is doing that enabling or furthering your macro goals in life? And if it is, of course, that's fantastic. But if it's not, then the question is, again, let's look at our goals. And I can promise you, as Jeremy has said here, focusing on drinking a lot of clean water, getting a lot of high quality sleep, staying active and eating nutrient dense foods, man, that's going to cure what ails you. And that's really going to empower you to, to be the best sense of yourself more than any pill powder or potion ever could. What do you think? Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to answer that, but I'm going to jump back to your smoking analogy because this is the one that always gets me. Whenever I start talking to somebody who's a little bit skeptical about eating more nutrient dense foods and, and say cutting out what I think are some toxic foods, particularly processed foods, processed sugars, and a lot of grains, particularly grains that contain gluten, they'll always say, oh, well, my grandfather lived to be 95 eating those foods. And my response will be, well, did you know anybody who smoked but didn't die of lung cancer? It, you know, it really doesn't mean that just because somebody could do it that they, you know, that it's a good thing. And secondly, that they didn't have any negative effects. Those people may have been tired all the time. There are a lot of day-to-day -day parts of our lives that actually improve other than just avoiding, you know, lung cancer, avoiding heart disease, avoiding diabetes, day to day, I have a ton more energy when I eat well, when I'm active, when I get out in the sun, when I sleep well. Day to day, I feel much happier. I don't ever get depressed. I, I, you know, occasionally if I'm eating badly or I'm not sleeping enough because I'm really busy at something, I'll feel my whole mood change. I'll become much more negative mentally about how things are going in my life and, you know, the direction things are headed. But if I'm eating well, if I'm sleeping well, uh, everything changes. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, I think those are the things that people can really latch on to. So, so to answer your question, yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I just wanted to jump back to that smoking analogy because I find it's one of the funniest things that I hear people say that, oh, I, had, you know, I knew so-and-so who lived to be 95, and they ate this junk food all their lives, so <laughs> I must be able to do it. But I do think there's room in anybody's life if, you know, if it's furthering your goals, you know, if it's going to make you happy once a month to eat a bit of junk food, I, I'm not the person who's going to tell anybody to stop that. You know, I cheat occasionally. I don't particularly like when I do it, and I don't really intend to do it very often. But of course, it happens. I mean, because sometimes I didn't, and then I don't beat myself up about it because I look at my diet and I say, well, I'm doing pretty well 99% of the time. So I eat badly 1% of the time. It's, it's one of those things. You've got to kind of take it in context. Uh, learn how to talk to yourself a little better and actually be compassionate and forgiving and figure out what your real goals are so that you can enact those on a daily basis. And I love the point about being compassionate and forgiving, uh, Jeremy, because I think you, you'd mentioned a couple times, sometimes let's, let's call them for lack of better terms, haters. And people are like, well, well, I'll just be hate, 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 hate. They always want to find something <laughs> wrong with everything. And my biggest thing is and there's even, to be very clear, even for the people who are really into nutrition and specifically are into the paleo lifestyle, there is certainly much even potentially hating going on between the best way to do even that. And, and oh, yeah. it's, people get so wrapped around the axle. And 
what what is just I- ironic to to me is when we uh, the the point here is if what you're doing is working for your goals, which may be very different and are in fact almost certainly different from my goals. Great. Like why, why, who cares? Like that's even, even from a paleo perspective, the irony is that if you look at the difference between like Maasai tribesmen and, uh, you know, uh, individuals uh, historically in the Pacific islands, the ratio of like animal to plant foods is vast. So to say that there is just like yeah. one right, right. The idea of right or perfect for everybody is, is so wrong. It's what are your goals and is what you're doing enabling you to do that? And if it is awesome. And if it's not, you know what, there's a lot of science and there's a lot of evolutionary common sense that might be able to help you out. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And if, you know, I'll bring in another analogy. If you go out and talk to professional elite athletes in any sport, they will tell you that the way that they live is not ideal for health overall. I mean, if, if we have some general concept of health, they'll tell you that they do a number of things that are not good for their bodies long term, but it's very much in furtherance of their goals. Because, you know, for instance, as a bodybuilder, is it ever really healthy to be at 3% body fat? No, humans are not designed to be at 3% body fat. It's a huge strain on your body. It, it's, there's a reason that it's so difficult to get down that low, but male bodybuilders do it because it's in furtherance of a goal that is incredibly important to them. And people look at you know bodybuilders and other elite athletes and think, oh, they're doing all sorts of healthy things. Well, they are in general. You know, 90% of what they do is very healthy, but then there's 10% of it that is not really healthy from a, a practical standpoint. It's just in furtherance of those goals. So absolutely, it really depends on your goals. And like you, I, I kind of get tired of all the <laughs> haters out there who you know, just want to say, oh, well, you're doing this wrong. Oh, why is this different? You know, oh, you have no support for that. And to which my response is, well, actually, yeah, we do have support for all of it. And, and B, you know, it, things are going to be different from person to person. And with it, anybody you talk to within paleo or any other sphere who's really into the science, who's really into the nutrition and the health aspects of it, and it's been doing it for a long time, uh, you know, in, in my sphere, people like Marxists and Rob Wolf, those type of people, they're the first people to tell you that there's a lot of individualization. At, at the same time, there, there are certain things. Like, for instance, gluten's not going to be good for anybody. You, you may not have as much of a reaction to it, but it's not going to be good for anybody. I mean, there's some toxicity to it, right? Just like eating arsenic's not going to be good for anybody. <laughs> and so there are going to be some, some basic rules that, you know, we could say, look, there are not going to be any humans this is really going to be good for. But at the same time, there is a ton of variability. So it really does depend on your goals. It really depends on your body, you know, some people are going to do better eating, you know, 50 to 60 percent carbs. Some people are going to do better eating 20 to 30 percent carbs. Um, but so long as you're getting those from good sources, either way, high quality, uh, you know, sources like tubers and things, you're going to be much better off. So, Jeremy, I, I couldn't agree with you more that in some ways you can judge the validity of a source of nutritional information by whether or not their message is one of, hey, there are some pretty universal principles. Uh, however, there's going to be some individual varia- uh, variability depending on your goals, much like uh, to, again, borrow just to, to conclude here with another analogy from our friend Stephen Covey. He gives a, a wonderful illustration in his book of someone walking up to another person and being like, oh man, my vision is so blurry. I can't see anything. Can you help me? And the person takes off the glasses they're wearing and places them on the face of the other person. And the other person is like, oh my God, like that's worse. Like I really can't see anything now. And the person who handed them their glasses is like, you're so ungrateful. Like these glasses work perfectly for me. I cannot believe like clearly this should be helping you. And and the point here, the analogy here is certainly there are universal laws of how our eyes work and all glasses work basically the same way. For example, like glass, the glasses that are completely opaque and that do not allow light through them will not serve anybody. <laughs> but in terms of <laughs> the type of prescription you need, uh, the style of the glasses that you wear, like there are universal principles that we all agree on, but just because a pair of glasses helps me to see better does not mean that that specific pair will help 
you to see better. However, that doesn't mean you should put duct tape over your eyes. Like there are <laughs> universal principles. What do you think about that analogy? I think I kind of went off the deep end there, but I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I mean, I, the, the duct tape one got me at the end. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, but you shouldn't give up on glasses just because the first pair didn't work. Exactly. I mean, it doesn't mean, you know, if, if, if the first thing you, you know, if you're allergic to nuts, don't eat nuts. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think they're healthy for some people, but some people have allergies to nuts. You can't eat them. I've had people, you know, email me and they'll be like, oh, th these recipes have nuts. What should I do? I'm like, well, you shouldn't eat that recipe. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not, it's not for everybody. I, I actually have a food manufacturing business too. And our product has nuts in it. And people are like, oh, can you make it without nuts? And I said, well, first of all, I can't because this product just can't make it without nuts. And I said, secondly, you know, it's not for everybody. I'm not going to make, there's no perfect food out there. There's no perfect diet. Uh, you know, they're, they're bad things, like you said, and they're glasses that don't work for people, but it doesn't mean that all glasses are bad. There's not going to be one pair that works for everybody. It would be amazing, and somebody would be really rich if they came out with that pair of that diet. In fact, maybe we should, <laughs> you and I should start looking for that. It's, uh, <laughs> sounds like a good business model, but <laughs> I don't think we're going to get there. Exactly. Just like you're not going to find a universal corrective lens or a universal contact. However, you you probably will find some some common denominators. And I think that's really the key is what can we all do to align ourselves to those common denominators that map to proven biology, which is when we talk about the science and also map to common sense. Right. Because that's sometimes when we we need both of those. We need both the common sense approach and we also need the a little bit of science, not a little bit, I would argue a lot of scientific validation. Cause sometimes I mean, common sense, again, common sense tells you the earth is flat. I look outside, it looks pretty daggone flat to me. Of course it's not, <laughs> but it does look that way. So sometimes we got to counterbalance our, our common sense with some science. So Jeremy, this is certainly, we could, we could talk for hours and hours and hours, and certainly you have a massive amount of insight. So if listeners want to learn more, what are the best places they can go to, to learn more about you and about your work? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm going to throw three out there. Uh, the place that they can find everything that I do uh, in terms of what I write is at jeremyhendon.com. Uh, the, and then I have two magazines and I have special free subscription offers for your listeners uh, to both of those magazines, which are right now only on iPad, but will be on Kindle in the near future. The first one is Paleo Living and your listeners can go to paleomagazine.com forward slash SSOS for Smarter Science of Slim. And the second magazine, which is an amazing magazine, if I do say so myself, I think your readers will love it, is called uh, Healthy Recipes Magazine. And that one is at healthyrecipesmag.com forward slash SSOS. And if they go to either of those links, uh, they can find free codes for free three month subscriptions to those magazines uh, if they have an iPad and it's, it's really easy to get and I hope they enjoy it. What I'm actually I just went to healthy recipes and the, the, screenshot on the first uh, page is a chaya seed pudding. So it looks like sanity will abound in, in <laughs> these episodes, which is, or excuse me, in these, these uh, magazines, which is, which is certainly great. And just listeners so that you can make sure you can find him uh, again, that's Jeremy. And his last name is spelled H E N D O N. Right, Jeremy. That's right. Beautiful. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today, and, and thank you for all of the, the curation and cultivation of, of great uh, non-ideological <laughs> information <laughs> out there. I think, it's, I think it's wonderful, and certainly we'd love to have you back on the show, brother. No, I look forward to it. It's been a ton of fun, and I hope your listeners enjoyed it. Thank you. And listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's show as much as I certainly did. And remember, this week and every week afterwards, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Talk with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely appreciate it. 